We have not, start from the top, had a chance to begin like this in September since 2019, have we really? Remember? Some of you remember 2019? Remember 2018? 2019? Yeah? Very selective record of it in there. Carefully edited. And then, oh my. But we're going to begin again. And how do we begin again? We begin the way we always begin in this place. By acknowledging that we are living, working, playing, doing everything else we do here at Green College, UBC, on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Hunkamanum speaking Muslim people. That formula, which, which we repeat, uh, not with any embarrassment uh, at repeating a formula, quite the contrary, it's important to have formulae like that. They are an important part of our life in this respect as in others. We acknowledge. When you say, I acknowledge, we acknowledge, and you make the acknowledgement, you do in fact make the acknowledgement. It's what the linguists call a speech act, a performative. It's one of those things that is done by saying it, like when the vice chancellor says, I admit you to the degree of doctor of philosophy. And they do, in that instant, it's done. It's a kind of verbal magic. In the matter of land acknowledgement, though, it only gets us so far. It gets us at least into a speech act, which is a kind of speech that feels as though it might be on the point of doing something, but it's not really getting very far yet. So what do we do next, having begun like that? Well, that, I think, is the leaping off point for what's going to happen this evening, unless I've misread the situation very badly. <laughs> so, that's enough of my feeble performatives. I'm going to turn things over now to the Patchworks podcast people. <laughs> Got that right. Rodney and Patara and Jane. This is your stage. This has always been your stage. Now you have it again and you can begin. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Well, thank you everyone for joining me this evening. Uh, my name is Rodney Stair. I'm one of the pistons. Oh boy, I don't know. Yes, pistons that make up the the machinery that is. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> the, anyways, one of the people that make up the team that help make this podcast work. And so um, today um, we'll share a little bit about the origins of the podcast. Um, talk a little bit about some of our own experiences, some of the takeaways uh, with relation to storytelling and so forth. And um, I also will interview some of the individuals here who took part in creating many of the episodes that we were so glad and very grateful to share with you. And of course, we can't begin without first recognizing that um, we are gathered today on the unceded and occupied homelands of the Musqueam people, but also in addition to acknowledging the tremendous role that the college has played in providing both the funding and the support to ensure that this podcast can happen, and then also always being there alongside us in terms of providing uh, logistics and helping us try to figure out, you know, especially over the various years that this has been going on, you know, how do we keep this thing going? So I just want to, of course, you know, make nods where necessary. So to begin, from the unceded and occupied homelands of the Musqueam. This is Patchworks. Across intersections and oceans, we hope to offer you a collection of stories about emerging and established leaders working to make change in their communities. So for those of you who haven't listened to the podcast yet, that is the opening part. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I'd be a little, a little cheesy like that and kind of reference at the beginning of the podcast. Um, both. Um, where the podcast is recorded, but also our main goal, which is to feature emerging and established um, community leaders. As I kind of hinted at at the beginning of the speech, I got a little ahead of myself. Um, you know, our agenda for today, for today will be we'll talk about the name of the podcast, the story of its development. I'll talk a little bit about my, experience, my experiences interviewing two uh, individuals, spe specifically Kalani Regis and Jason Cyrus, and then maybe getting a little academic and thinking about storytelling and responsibility and how that sort of weaved into um, my relationship to the podcast. Um, and then 
talk a little bit about who we've interviewed so far and who's next. And then, of course, I'll introduce the team, and then we'll chat with the team a little bit. So I'm very excited to kind of move through all these pieces with you. So to begin, I mean, Patchworks is a name that mostly speaks for itself. You get a sense of weaving. But I thought that I would maybe share a little bit more of the, the kind of the dimensions and the ways that kind of informed why I, um, well, why the name sort of means a lot to me. Um, and part of that comes from poetry. So for those of you who've had the pleasure or displeasure of interacting with me, um, I do like poetry quite a lot. When I, when I lived here at Green, it was on my door, it was on my walls, it was in my thesis. It's also in many of my presentations. So um, I, I guess it's only fitting that the, you know, the name of the podcast <laughs> is informed by a poem that I hold sort of near and dear to my heart, and it's by uh, Melvin Dixon, and it's called Aunt Ida Pieces a Quilt. And so at the beginning of the poem, um, there's a quotation by Jesse Jackson that says, you are right, but your path patch isn't big enough. And that's in a famous speech that he made before the Democratic Convention. And I'll read just a little bit more of the, the quotation and then kind of weave in why I feel like this particular quotation is relevant to the work that we do with the podcast. So, farmers, you seek fair prices, and you are right, but you cannot stand alone. Your patch is not big enough. And workers, you fight for fair wages. You are right, but your patch of labor is not big enough. And women, you seek comparable work, worth and pay equity. You are right, but your patch is not big enough. And so in thinking about the name Patrick's and this idea of in each of the episodes, we'll have people joining us who will talk about the specific challenges they face in life, the different sort of ways that they've worked with community to address them, thinking about these different stories and how, you know, individually, um, you know, they can sound overwhelming or like the work that's done individually in itself, to, to even move the shift the needle a little bit can be overwhelming. But together, when we imagine all of these stories together as a large quilt, a large patchwork, um, that, you know, it feels, you know, there's a little bit more hope within that. And the poem itself, if you wish to check it out, also uh, is about a family gathering together and reflecting on the passing of, of Junie, who was something who was someone who was really important to them, and they're gathering all his things, his choir robe, his tie, and they're weaving it into the quilt that was then going to join the AIDS Memorial Quilt uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. So again, like this idea of weaving, and if you've ever interacted with Pacific Islander academia, we're all about weaving. We love talking about weaving. Uh, and so it's only natural that I would both rely on poetry and a weaving metaphor. In terms of the origin of the podcast itself, um, I thought I'd be dramatic and be like, the podcast began with an exodus. Um, and so <laughs> in 2020, um, near the end, uh, you know, Green College suddenly found itself with a lot fewer residents. I don't know the specific number, 30, uh, you know, it was just, you know, there was not a lot of people doing a lot of things. And so one of these projects that sort of appeared before us and Patara sort of came to me and was like, I have an idea. Uh, and that's where and then Mark, we looped Mark in and then we sort of began to have these conversations about like, okay can have a podcast because that's the one way that we can have programming at the college while still re respecting public health guidelines, still engage with people and still have, you know, a little life. Uh, <laughs> and, and from those, we start to think about questions about what do we want in a podcast? So we drew up a long list of people we would like to talk to, uh, you know, and who would we like to feature? And in those conversations, we thought to ourselves, okay, we we're very lucky that we're Green College. We're very lucky to have this financial support. We're also very lucky to be a part of an international network of, uh, you know, scholars and community leaders who have passed through these doors. And so we can really talk to anybody. I mean, within reasonable measure, I think, you know. Uh, and, well, in these conversations, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could start off with an emerging voice, with a young voice, uh, specifically that of Kalani Regis. And the choice, and maybe there was a little lobbying on my part, so I apologize, Patara, um, also kind of reflected where I was uh, in my own life at the time. Don't worry, this is not a biography. You didn't come for this. Um, you know, I was, I was looking to see, like, oh, you know, I love Green College, love UBC, not a whole lot of Pacific Islanders in, in faculty and so forth. So it would be great with, if given the resources and the opportunity that I could carve out, you know, a little bit of space. And so I thought, okay, let's start with... Uh, Kalani Reyes, who was a young Chamorro activist from Guam, or who was based in Guam at the time, but comes from uh, the Marianas Islands. Um, and let's hear about, let's put her at the forefront. So let's, you know, sort of cast off the ship um, with a young voice. And then afterwards, we can bring in the more established uh, 
and academics and so forth. And so that was kind of the conversations that began at the beginning of like, who would we like to feature? Um, how would we like to engage in conversation with them? How is this going to work? I think is a question we've repeatedly asked ourselves throughout the course of the, the development of the podcast. I still ask myself. Uh, and so these are some of the questions that kind of you know, met us at the beginning of our journey. And so to talk a little bit about the two individuals, because uh, as we move to interviewing the panel, well, it's not really a panel, but you know, um, the other interviewees, interviewers, interviews, well, a little bit of both. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the two individuals that I got to uh, interview. So as I mentioned before, Kalani Reyes, who herself has her own podcast called Deep Pacific. And if you have the opportunity to listen, it's incredible. Two seasons, they cover a whole bunch of different things ranging from faith and religion, colonialism. And one thing that was really important to me and why I reached out to her was what is it like for um, queer people uh, in our communities. And that was the main reason that I reached out to her because, you know, during the pandemic, you know, feeling kind of lowly, you know, not leaving my room a whole lot and beginning to think existentially about the path. I think many of us were, our, <laughs> our career paths, you know, what we would like our research to look like. And I was thinking, oh, you know, it'd be great if I could learn a little bit more about myself. And I'm very thankful for the, all the opportunities that the university has given me. Uh, but, you know, thinking about like, how can I find a way to, um, think a little bit about like what does it not only mean to be queer because I've had that opportunity to you know work in community-based organizations my research features and kind of navigates experiences of queer youth uh, in mental health context during COVID-19 but also thinking about what do those intersections when overlapping with being a Pacific Islander like what does that sort of present for me and this podcast sort of came out well not came out of nowhere because then that's kind of due suspect you know whatever I don't speak Latin I don't know how to pronounce that correctly but you know just it came out of nowhere and it was such a breath of fresh air. And then so I sent her a message over Twitter and she was very willing. And we sat down and I interviewed her and it was the first episode. It lasted three hours because she's in Guam. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a nightmare to edit down. We were routinely, because she was right near a, an army base, we were routinely, as we were talking about colonialism, interrupted by fighter jets flying over, um, just, doing, uh, just doing their you know, usual sort of thing that you know, military industrial complexes do. Um, and, and yeah, and it was just an incredible way to start. Um, I think, again, this is the part where I thank the office for, its, for their patience, because, you know, we, we decided on a name, we decided who we wanted to interview, and then it was perhaps six months of <laughs> that, just a radio silence on our end, but, you know, it was meeting with Kalani, and it was really great, too, because in that interview, not only was I if any of you happen to run a podcast of your own at any point in time, interviewing a podcaster means that while you're producing them, they're also producing you. So if you listen to the first episode, um, she brought in a couple of clips from other youth from her own podcast that she had deliberately picked because she wanted me to answer questions that they were talking about and that had to do with you know, mixed heritage, um, you know, being diaspora. And I only realized after, and I was like, wait, Kalani, did you... Was this deliberate? I just thought you were picking random quotations. But no, it was deliberate. So I think there's something really fun about interviewing someone else who's very good at what they do and they kind of like, kind of guide you even when you don't notice you're being guided yourself. And then of course, Jason Cyrus, who in the fourth episode, um, um, we had the opportunity to talk with him. So he was here, we're very lucky to, this was uh, near the later part of 2021. So we were meeting people in person and I got to interact with him in person. We had tea. We talked about his work as a curator, um, his upcoming event at the Agnes, Agnes Etherington Art Center at Queens University, uh, which was history, neither, history is neither black nor white, looking at like um, cotton production um, and um, interrogating um, archival pieces, which is something that comes up also in a lot of our podcasts too, the archive and interrogating the archive. Um, and that was also an exciting episode as well because, you know, just getting a sense of like, how do you build community? How do you interact? How do you structure a podcast in a way that oftentimes, especially specifically with Jason's, um, where you don't immediately go into the subject matter. You kind of talk about the things that they enjoy first before, because oftentimes, you know, when you have a short amount of time, you can get very like intense very quickly and then you leave. So, but that'll, that'll be more when I talk about responsibility and storytelling. So yes, so those were two episodes that I covered that I very fond of. Now, oh, actually, one thing that I forgot to mention, this graphic that you saw, which also speaks to the origin of the podcast, um, for the first episode, because I was quite new to this idea of like, 
audio engineering and you know sound and how sound bounces off of walls. Um, this is a quite this is an artistic rendering of the kind of <laughs> setup that I had. We had a bunch of chairs in my studio at Green College with a bunch of blankets over it in order to kind of like. I don't know what I was doing, but I thought that it would help make the, the audio recording less echoey. So this is, uh, I don't have slippers, and I don't think my legs are that hairy, but, you know, <laughs> this is uh, me, I guess, under a bunch of covers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about storytelling and responsibility. So one of the great things that I liked about talking to Kalani and starting off with Kalani was that she just had such a wealth of knowledge and a real like intentionality. So in this quotation she says, I want the Deep Pacific podcast to be intentional because too many times people are very flippant with our history or with saying things about us without asking us first. And throughout the course of the interview and both the preparatory conversations we had beforehand in our friendship, Afterwards, we thought a lot about, we talked a lot about like what does it mean to be intentional, uh, specifically in the context of podcasts. Uh, in my research, you know, I th we think I think about this a lot in terms of you know in the interview context. You know, what is our responsibility to the research participants? You know, how do we take care of them? And that's those questions only seem to like naturally transition into when we think about podcasts because at least generally when we record podcasts it's very much like okay we meet the person we interview them we produce it we send it out famous you know um and as i've kind of been working through the podcast and also progressing with my own research i began to think a lot about like if we're going to be intentional with how we develop podcasts and if we're going to give ourselves the space to experiment with podcasts then how can the podcast just be like one step in terms of like larger kind of community building efforts and not the sense that this single episode is going to you know change the the face of the pacific but rather like in our individual practices that in my individual practices which i think a lot about in research in terms of okay um you know inter you know interacting with communities over the long term rather than short term and sort of helicoptering in how does that also then match with how i interact with interview participants or sorry <laughs> the people that i interview in the podcast um and so part of that naturally attaches itself to questions of responsibility so how are we responsible when when i sit down with kalani and we talk about her experiences with climate change at the being at the forefront of climate change in the pacific or about her experiences you know diaspora or organizing what are my responsibilities to her, her over the long term other than just you know now we're friends you know what does it look like in terms of um what what i sort of cover in my thesis oh god sorry i keep on talking about my thesis but i guess i just defended it so i might as well um <laughs> you know this idea of you know uh, when I talk about these kind of like Fijian conceptualizations of vakaturanga or vaku, vakamara, um, vakamarama, which is, you know, it's kind of like chiefly responsibility, like, you know, now that you've gifted this idea of like treating knowledge as a gift, and so if we also see in interviews and podcasts as a gift, then moving forward, it means the things that Kalani has shared with me, I have a responsibility to either, you know, not just like retweeted a bunch of times <laughs> on all my different accounts, but also thinking about like, okay, what does this look like for how I think about the Pacific generally? Because before I was very focused on Fiji, but now it's like, okay, you know, Fiji has a very specific relationship to um, colonization and it can be different from, you know, other places like Guam, like Aotearoa, like Australia. And so it's like, how do I then, you know, take these conversations where we talk about the diversity of experience in the Pacific to then apply it to my own work? Um, and also my own understanding of the topic, and also encourage others to think about it, or maybe other universities in their sort of intake forms when they ask, you know, what your ethnic background is. And they don't say Pacific Islander. And, and then also, yeah, not getting overwhelmed by perfectionism. Um, I think that was a thing as well. We because it's a podcast, and I know neither, well, maybe Jane, you're very accomplished, and also Patara as well, you're both very accomplished. I'm okay. Um, <laughs> um, you know, we, we're new to podcasts, and so one thing that I've learned is just that you know, we have to give ourselves the space to realize, and I, I know it was quite overwhelming, I know Pedro in the audience over there, and Lindsay as well, uh, sort of witnessed the, when, especially when you interact with people that you look up to, or people who are like very accomplished, like professors and so forth, that you, know, you put a lot of time doing the research, and you know, you're like, okay, I need to know everything, and I need to know what they did 20 years ago, and how that you know, shifted them into their life where they are now, so that I don't look stupid. Um, and then like this, and then at some point in time, especially I recall our, sorry, I don't realize, I can't try to make eye contact with the both of you, but 
when I interviewed Michelle Good, who, uh, Cree author Michelle Good, um, I didn't think the interview had went that well. And so I just could not look at the, <laughs> the episode for a month. And then I was like, okay, Lindsay, Pedro, uh, we're going to go to Gibson Room, which is a small room in Graham House, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, and we're going to listen to it. And then we just listen to it. And then afterwards, we're like, Ronnie, what's wrong with you? This was a perfectly fine interview. Uh, and so, you know, thinking about, like, especially for those of us who are, like, you know, using the podcast platforms to tell stories that are important to us or that we would like to tell. And we put a, lot, put a lot of pressure on ourselves to do, like, an incredible job to ask the best questions that have never been asked before or to, like, you know, address a topic that has never sort of, in a way that has never kind of, like, popped into the minds of the people that we're interviewing where it's like, you know, maybe we can just ask simple questions. And then through these conversations, those simple questions can be gradually more complex. And that was a big takeaway for me in terms of, you know, my God, Rodney, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And it's also better for your mental health in the long term. And yeah, so I think these are some of the, the things that I, as I kind of engage and think about the podcast and also in conversation with Batara and Jane, thinking about like, okay, well, community, you know, community-based work is important to all of us. Um, and I, in some of the questions I'll ask afterwards, I'll sort of draw, draw that into the, the, the topic. Um, you know, how can we continue to take these things and, you know, not just be, okay, I was a green, produced a podcast, goodbye, you know. So, yeah, those are some of the things I'm thinking about. This is by no means a done deal. I'm still trying to figure this out. And so in the spirit of that, because I love poetry, um, one of the contributors, um, uh, Vivian Lee, had recently uh, published a poem, um, I think with the, oh, God, the Canadian... Uh, oh, no. Forgive me. Oh, no, I wrote it down. Sorry. Sorry. The League of Canadian Poets in a little chapbook. And I thought I would read this out because it's very much in the, the flavor of being kind to yourself. Um, I guess because this is both a presentation about a podcast, but also a recruitment drive. Uh, <laughs> and so I would, I would like to read out this poem by Vivian. Uh, it's called I Remember Now. I remember now we don't have to be good to be loved like how we rested our sunset minds in the shallow altar of our ancestors along dotted lines of nostalgia and regret and signed our names under the midnight umbrella, uplifting across mountains, our values threaded with flashes of vermilion light and sandstorm song. I don't have to open my mouth and encase you because of the lava stone heat, nope, sorry, nor thaw my hands against your bare chest in the night of the wandering desert we don't have to linger in the thin oasis nor lose our meeting place between stars and horizon, halos of boats curling smoke to meet our lips. I realize we are somewhere in the hand of the moon. We are walking somewhere I don't recall, and the footprints you leave behind simmer with water-bending desires. As we cling to breath between the curves of our bodies, I repeat after your voice, warm with butterfly thrummings, and the beat of falling water over rocks. We don't have to be good enough to be loved. We don't have to be good enough to be loved. It's not done yet, but yeah, let's keep it. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll move into the section where I tell you a little bit about the people who participated uh, in the various episodes. So some of the current episodes, as I mentioned, Kalani Rejas, uh, Dr. Marie, Marie, Rini Samawani, Mary Kitagawa, Jason Cyrus, and Patsy George. And soon to come, for those of you who followed us on Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts, including Apple Music and so forth, um, we have Dr. Zain Yao, who talks about uh, the politics of discontent, uh, their, their new book, I think, was it Politics of Disaffected, The Politics of Discontent um, in 19th Century America? Something? 18th, 18th Century America, yes. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Cree author Michelle Good. Kai Cheng Tom, and then Poet Laureate Fiona Tinwei Lam. So keep an eye out, subscribe, like, whatever you need to do. And so, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, I kind of drew on the, the opening words. And if you've listened to the podcast, those words are kind of transposed above music. And so one thing that I forgot to mention, which is strange that I would do that, um, is that you know, uh, the Patrick's pod podcast is produced by um, Green College residents. And except for our editor, who's delightful, every sort of element has been contributed by current or former Green College members. So the music that you hear, both the opening and closing music, and also the transition music, was composed and sort of assorted by Gabriel Lansted, um, who lived at the college, I think, 2019. Um, uh, Judith Valerie Engel as well. 
Um, and so they, during the pandemic, were very kind to record them both playing piano and then sending it over to us. And then we kind of interlaced that throughout each episode. And then also our, collabor our, co our contributors, um, Serena Klumpenhauer, uh, Vivian Lee, and Lindsay Kem, who's in the room. Lindsay. Um, um, they will be present in our future episodes upcoming. Um, and then, of course, our production team. So Olivia Wheeler. Um, I just want to very briefly share her um, biography with you. I'll read it out. I know it's kind of um, not de rigueur to read out, but forgive me. Um, so Olivia Wheeler is a mixed race Chinese Canadian sound designer, composer, and multidisciplinary artist. Her main practice in sound and is in sound composition and for theater. She's worked with theater companies across the country. Additionally, she works in editing podcasts and other audio online audio works, which includes Patchworks, Slice of Pie with CPO, um, Liberated Feminist Future with Nightwood Theater, and Transformation Talks with the NAC. Some of her upcoming work includes associate sound design for the co-production of Bad Parent at Sold Pepper Theater Company, Vancouver Asian Canadian Theater Company, and Prairie Theater Exchange, and developing a performance piece called Hey Girl, about her grandmother's experience through the Second Sino-Japanese War. So I thought I would just feature her because, I mean, I'm so glad that we have someone to do the editing for us and she does an incredible job. So I've talked enough. Um, and so I'd like to now sort of transition this to a very brief conversation. I know you don't like that photo, I apologize. Um, with our two interviewers, so. This is, you know, <laughs> I don't know. This is uh, it's like some kind of experimental theater. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for listening to me talk 30 minutes, for 30 minutes. Um, maybe to begin, can you tell me a bit about yourselves? I know I very briefly um, referenced you throughout, but perhaps starting with Jane, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what are some of your interests and so forth. Sure. Um, okay. I should really be used to talking into a microphone by now, but it still makes me really self-conscious. Um, so I'm Jane. I'm a uh, master's student at UBC in the English program, or I just recently finished this summer. Um, I did my BA at uh, Queen's University, where I worked at uh, the Queen's Journal, which is perhaps the most rele relevant uh, background experience to doing this podcast. Um, yeah, I've been a resident member at Green for just over two years now. Watched it go from the skeletal COVID pandemic to a full-blown college again. Um, yeah, Bittar. Thank you. Um, it was really wonderful to hear uh, your introduction to the podcast and all the work that we worked so hard on at the beginning, of course. Um, so just a short introduction of myself. I'm Patara. I also just defended my thesis in sociology, thank you, um, on the 1907 anti-Asian riots. I did my uh, Bachelor of Arts at Carleton University in Ottawa. And I also did a master's in Spain in the Basque Country. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, I think I'll start. First, Jane, before you came to Green College, as you mentioned, you were involved with the Queen's University Journal. You wrote from a variety of topics varying from volunteerism, sexual assault, and race car driving. Um, what was it like for you to immerse yourself in these different topics? And I mean, I know we relied a lot on your skills. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about like how you brought that with you to the podcast? Um, yeah, first of all, I should say I really respect your research skills at this point, Rodney, because I wrote a story about volunteerism when I was in the second year of my undergrad, which would have been in like 2013, 2014, and you dug that up to ask me this question now. <laughs> um, and I, I want to believe that your experience with the podcast might have informed that, um, even though it scares me a little bit. Um, so in terms of storytelling, the first thing that came to mind when I saw this question was back when I was doing that work, I was approaching a lot of very big topics, perhaps not the race car driving, but maybe the other things. Um, really not knowing anything about how to tell a story or about the topic. And 
naively, I often plunged into those topics believing that I would figure it out along the way. Um, approaching the storytelling project for this podcast, I think, was a little bit different because I couldn't quite so naively go in believing that I could ask questions on the fly and think quickly and, and, and figure it out as I went along. But I do think that those experiences gave me a certain value in believing that there is value in approaching a topic as a novice and approaching interviewing an expert about it as a complete novice. Because a really important thing for me about this podcast was we're going to talk about things that are very complex, very difficult, that people have spent years of their lives thinking, writing, researching, studying. And for the people listening to it, most likely they haven't done that. And so my role was always to be, okay, if I knew nothing about this, what would I want to know? How would I be tracing this? How would I be responding to this person? Because those things that happen that are really complex have to be translated into an understandable way for most people. And it was very valuable, I think, to be able to walk in and go, okay, I know nothing about your research. Explain it to me. Explain it to me like I know absolutely nothing about it. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking about as you were talking is the idea of responsibility for stories. And those early experiences when I was a completely naive, idealistic undergrad student um, encountering very difficult topics um, that fundamentally changed people's lives and um, gave me a sense of the responsibility for those stories. And if you were going to take those stories that people have offered to you, that they have given you, that have huge impact for their lives, and you're going to put them in some sort of medium that's accessible, that is going to exist for potentially longer than them, um, there is a certain responsibility to that that I maybe didn't appreciate back then, and I have so much more appreciation for now. And I'm very grateful that you talked about that because it's a very important thing about this. Yeah, I know. I know for myself that piece around like going in as a novice was very difficult. Hence the Michelle Good anecdote, where, <laughs> where you're just like, "Well, I want to, I want to be able to go toe to toe with you." But the reality is, you know, you have to be, you have to be modest <laughs> and accept your limitations. And I think it does make ultimately, when you accept your limitations, it makes you a better interviewer because you stop trying to pretend like, for example, I don't know anything about fashion curation or isotope analysis or going into an archive and looking at, you know. Um, old garments and figuring out their, you know, tracing their lineages. So if you acknowledge that, then, yeah. I knew absolutely nothing about Dr. Renisa Mawani's work, and she was the first person that I interviewed for the podcast. And I went, you've written multiple books that I don't have time to read, and I know nothing about your research. She's a, like, a, a scholar of, like, um, she's a, a legal scholar of the history of colonization, and I knew like nothing about the things that she was talking about. Um, so I had to enter it with that kind of humility of like, okay, educate me. I guess like listening to some of the things that Jay mentioned, I know, um, Patara, you've been incredibly involved with a lot of community organizations as you were doing your scholarship, specifically, you know, the Pacific Canada Heritage Center Museum of Migration. Um, and you've kind of touched on a lot of that storytelling pieces. Can you tell us a little bit more about that sort of work and how that kind of helped kind of helped you think about interviewing? Yes, so um, I've been doing a lot of work with PCHC. It's a local nonprofit organization here in Vancouver. Um, and they're really focused on uh, anti-racism. So working with different communities, they have a lot of different uh, directors um, that, from different institutions, such as the University of Washington. And they do a lot of great work. Also here, uh, Dr. Henry Yu, I think, uh, is on the board. Um, and he does a lot of work in ACAM. Um, and I think the podcast helped set a really strong foundation uh, to work with young people and to uh, understand how to make good stories, stories that connect uh, with maybe unknown or untold histories. Um, and I think that's what the podcast does so well, is it explores these very interesting uh, avenues um, and it gathers people from the community especially here at Green College uh, I think your 
uh, presentation, you know, did a really good job of pointing out how uh, many, how important it was for these different people that came along during the process uh, to set the foundation for what the podcast is. And for example, Three Music or uh, the connection to the different uh, people that eventually are on uh, or interviewed on the podcast. Um, so at PCHC, uh, we are doing video uh, stories. Um, so that is different from a podcast, but I think in many respects, you can take in the same kind of lessons. Um, so you're still doing interviews, but you're being recorded. Um, and uh, the emphasis, again, is on community. So interviewing people from the community uh, and the different impacts that they might face uh, as a result of racism, as a result of uh, the pandemic, for instance. Um, and yeah, uh, just trying to highlight how important it is to tell these different stories from the community to have a better understanding of history here in British Columbia and across Canada yeah. uh, from you know, the average person. Yeah. Could I just interpolate a technical request? The yeah. microphones that you have are not amplifying the voice. They're just, we hope, transmitting it to people following the live stream. Oh. So you need to adopt your front of the class <laughs> um, teaching voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody will be hanging on every word. Yeah. I think, I think a quick follow-up question I have for you um, is, I guess you, you talked a little bit about like, you know, you've done a lot of storytelling virtually and we, we, we talked about how like this took place during the pandemic. <laughs> so what was it like for you when we were thinking about um, like recording podcasts and telling those stories um, with kind of COVID as like an albatross or like, you know, in the background, like well, how was that for you? Because you interviewed Mary Kitagawa. So like, what was that like interview, like th planning and coordinating that interview with the threat of COVID? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we we're all affected, especially graduate students with COVID um, in, in terms of their work. If people were doing in-person uh, interviews, it was a, diff a very difficult process, but I think I was quite lucky. Um, so originally how I met uh, uh, Mary Kitagawa was uh, because I was doing a project on Japanese Canadian uh, in an internment here. So just going into the community and trying to understand what intergenerational trauma was. But of course, uh, with the pandemic, I couldn't do those interviews in person. So I had to think, well, what can I do? And uh, the archive became a really important place. I can, well, I can do archival work. I can look at documents. I can look at photographs. I can look at different portraits and, and try to make sense of a history that is well known here in Vancouver. And, the 1907 anti-Asian riots is a big moment uh, for uh, different communities here, but uh, the internment is also a big moment um, in terms of understanding, uh, you know, discrimination and uh, various acts of racism and how to overcome it. You know, um, how how this also led to different community-building projects. Um, so, uh, you know, I had something to fall back on, and I, when we were starting this project, I thought Mary Kitagawa would be a really good person to uh, talk to because, um, you know, she's very willing and she's a very important story that people should hear. Uh, and because I know her, um, not so well, but I, I do know her, and she is a mentor, uh, you know, there's a likelihood she'll say yes. And she did, <laughs> thankfully, she said yes. Um, but I think COVID made me think about how to go and, and do this interview process, um, what to rely on. I mean, you know, because I was also going into the archive and asking questions about the archive, I was able to go into Mary Kitagawa's history and kind of um, ask myself more questions about that and learn more from it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Katara. Um, I guess. Okay, um, maybe I'll ask a couple more questions and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And I know, I, I believe there's a reception, so perhaps uh, people here are um, longing for wine and cheese. So um, I think I'll just ask a couple more follow-up questions and then I'll open it to the, to the group. 
Um, I guess maybe, maybe I'll ask just one question and apply it to the both of you, you know, multitasking. Um, and this is pretty standard, but like, what are some of the takeaways from, I know, and it's, it's a big one too. Um, what are some of the takeaways or just how have the episodes, because you've both, you know, interviewed um, individuals and also who cover very like heavy topics. Um, as you sort of look back on your experience, how would you describe that? How would you describe those experiences? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, can't. I think it's really important to have a good team. Um, it, doing a podcast, like you were saying, it takes a lot of planning. It takes uh, a, a lot of different elements that you might not see in the final, uh, final results. And I think we were quite lucky to have Rodney there, uh, helping us throughout the process. And uh, you know, Ron, Rodney is a very good planner. It did take. I mean, <laughs> because of COVID, there was uh, definitely some hiccups, uh, some missteps, but I think that's reasonable to expect from, from anyone during a, a time like that. Um, and w if you have a good team, then you can really fall back on them when, when things get difficult. I really liked your story about going into the Gibson room and you know, having a brainstorming session. I think you know, it's, it's things like that that really uh, you can lean on when you have a team. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, I think it's important also to have had a team that was very forgiving. Um, as uh, Roddy mentioned earlier, our first episode took like six months to, <laughs> to create, and there's an episode that I've been working on for what, like eight months now? <laughs> um, because I was trying to finish my thesis at the same time. Um, and I, I, like, I remember one of the first things that we really had to overcome was just sheer discomfort with hearing our own voices being recorded. Actually, I still have not listened to the full episodes that I did because I can't listen to the sound of my own voice. And when I was editing them, I would literally fast forward over me talking, look at the timestamp, and then write into the editing notes, please cut out this time. Um, and I would leave like the bare minimum of me actually talking. Um, so there was like a lot of discomforts to overcome, but I think it was really important that we were very forgiving with each other about actually what a challenging thing it turned out to, to, to be um, in, in terms of all the back work and everything like that. Um, I think maybe my biggest takeaway is what an incredible privilege it is to meet incredible people and hear their stories for yourself. Um, I really hope that this translates in a lot of the episodes, um, that a lo like every person that we interviewed has an, like an incredible story and an incredible personality. Um, I think what comes to mind the most for me was my, ep my interview with Patsy George. Um, Patsy George is I was a lifelong social worker in Canada. Um, she lives in Vancouver still. She's a huge opera enthusiast. She travels the world. Um, she was originally born uh, in Kerala, southern province in India, and she immigrated to the United States to do her university education uh, in the US. And she was just such an amazing storyteller. Like She had me laughing so much. I had to edit out so much of just me laughing. Um, like she told me this story about like getting to New York um, uh, like when she first came to the United States from India and it was the middle of a snowstorm and she didn't have boots and so like the first thing that she did in the United States was like go buy boots but she couldn't find the right store and and it was just this like incredible ability to weave like a really intense experience and important experience with humor and and levity and I was just in awe at how she could tell a story like that. And I remember at some points in her interview, like she was crying, I was crying. This was over Zoom as well, so we were just crying over mm -hmm. Zoom together. Um, and I think her recording was about six hours long <laughs> that I had to edit down. Um, anyway, so that I think for me is the biggest takeaway from this is a pod this podcast was so much work and continues to be a lot of work. Um, 
but it was an absolutely incredible privilege for those hours spent listening to someone who has so much wisdom, so much to tell, all of these episodes that the person being interviewed had so much to say that's so valuable, and it was an incredible privilege to hear that from them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you so much, Patara. Um, so I guess that wraps up our side of the presentation. Um, I'll open it up to the, the group if you have any questions for us, um, and then, yeah, I guess we'll go from there. I guess Mark will be, do we have, have we gone over, we've gone over? No, 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 they won't be ready for us with you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, Pedro, right out the gate. Oh, do it with. Well, thank you for the presentation, Rodney. My question is more uh, has to do with uh, this experience that I perfectly remember from you, Lindsay, and I in one of our stud study nights. Um, and you were like, I remember you being like super terrified of, oh, this is like super bad. I don't like, don't want, really want to hear about it. And it was a really good interview, really, really good interview. And it's just to come for people in the audience to hear. I had the privilege of listening to it before. Um, my question, and sorry if it's too direct, but what have you learned from that? Like, have what, like, have yeah. you? I always tell you, like, oh yeah, like, don't be that afraid for what could go wrong. Just be more enthusiastic. Yeah. Have like, what could you say that you learned from actually realizing that you did a good thing? <laughs> yeah, I think, and Jane touched on this a lot, and I guess I touched on this. I guess we all just touched on it. This idea of just like being forgiving, both to ourselves and then also how we build. Oh. oh, yeah, I'll be too amplified. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, just thinking about how we built that into the process. So when you were talking about that forgiveness, it's like, okay, you know, we're all grad students. We're at Green College. That means we're naturally high achieving, and maybe we have issues with, like, boundaries and, like, you know, rest and stuff. And so it's like when we have these opportunities, you know, being intentional about, like, okay, um, this is hard work. We're talking and we're sharing spaces with individuals who've lived full, complicated lives where they've accomplished a lot of things, experienced a lot of things, and not only will it impact them, but it will also impact us. So I think this thinking about like, how do we take care of ourselves and sort of building, so if I were to do this podcast again, um, I won't, but you know, <laughs> um, you know, it's like, how can we ensure that we build it straight into the kind of the DNA of how we do um, the production about like, okay, have check-ins, be like, how are you after this interview? and you know, routinely check in and just making sure that we look after each other. Um, because I think oftentimes, you know, especially it's like, okay, I'll take care of this episode. It can be very isolating. And then, you know, we don't communicate and such and all these kind of things. So I think that's the first lesson. The lesson is like kind of being, building in forgiveness into like the, the, like the production of a podcast. And then also given those kind of high expectations that we have as grad students or as former grad students, um, then being like, okay, you know, at some point in time, you have to kind of like challenge those um, intrusive thoughts in your head when you're interviewing people that you look up to or people that you know, you're intimidated by or people who are doing research of things you don't know anything about. And just being like, you know, th they know that I don't know anything about this topic. They're not expecting me to come in and engage with them as if I also have a degree in their field. And so like building in that space for care for yourself because we're already stressed, you know, pandemic, work, studies, there's no sense of doing it to ourselves <laughs> when, when we're doing the things that we like in our hobbies. So I think those are the two, I don't, do you feel like I've answered? Um, we kind of talk past each other quite frequently, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, thank you, Pedro, that was a really good question. First of all, thank you for a wonderful talk and congratulations to all of you on successful defenses, so well done, table over there. Um, so understanding that the podcast itself is its own archive and you are choosing and curating um, and creating that archive yourselves. Um, what have you felt were some of the guiding principles that go into that and or like having done a couple episodes, seeing it in its formation, 
um, some of like the overarching themes that one person, you know, looking back on it or, or going through this in totality might come up with, yeah. if that made sense. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I could speak to the revisiting the episode and real, not realizing there were like narratives. Like one thing, lots of talk about the ocean. Like, <laughs> And I was like, this was not intentional. We just picked people that we wanted to talk to. And then suddenly, Kalani was talking about the ocean. Renisa was talking about, like, ocean as method. You know, Patsy was talking about travels across, you know. And um, Jason, who's from Guyana, was talking about the slave trade, about cotton. So at some point in time, we're like, how did the ocean get into this? And so that's one thing. It's almost like a reflection of movement, a reflection of water, and how that kind of fits, which also extremely Pacific Islander. I guess maybe this was like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm an archetype. I'm a stereotype. Oh my God. Um, but I think that's like one, one thing that came up in terms of like, it seems like we're unintentionally creating an archive of stories about the sea, about moving across the sea, relationships to water uh, and so forth, which I mean, great first, you know, greenies moving forward. And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Any other? Well, I, I think that's a really important question because I think um, uh, the way that the podcast approached the archive uh, was in many ways a non-traditional sense of how we imagine archives and uh, what can an archive be composed of, uh, what narratives can we really tell from the archive. Um, and I think that really speaks to the broader kind of literature on archives at the moment. Um, you know, that... Uh, the archive as a space, especially in a digital world, is much more expansive than we originally imagined. It's not just a repository where we keep documents, but it's these different people with lived experiences uh, that can speak to things that we may not know about uh, or understand fully. So one of the things that we had, I think, a lot of trouble with at the beginning of the project was defining that. Um, I think we had a list of different names and like taglines and, and descriptions that we were trying to sort through about how do you actually describe this. And I remember at the time looking at other podcasts and going, okay, well, this one's really specific. This one's really specific. This one is about like murder mysteries, this one is about that, this one is about recipes, and we didn't really have a very strong, like, this is what this podcast is about. Um, and then I think we just kind of went forward and started interviewing people anyways, um, and it came to be formed through the stories that they told. Because I think if you set yourself maybe a, a topic as broad and as ongoingly negotiated as this one, you are going to get people who are going to approach it in very different and unique ways. Um, my episode with Patsy was very interesting because it was very retrospective. It was, this is the chronology of my life, these are the experiences that I have had, and I structured the episode like that, as a chronology of her life. Um, Contrast that with a episode, the one that I'm still working on, um, <laughs> which was with a grad student uh, who doesn't have that structure to their story, who is much more hypothetical or abstract in, in, in what they have to say and what actions are, are good and much more questioning, and that has an entirely different structure. Um, so I don't know if, if the idea of a specific archive for this podcast, maybe it's still being negotiated a little bit. Oh, it comes okay. into being a little bit more with every episode. Yeah. Oh, like a, like as a literal archive? Because I was imagining it like oh, metaphorically. I, I was also doing it for a metaphor. Oh, okay. As well, so. Yeah. If I if I could quickly maybe double dip, I just one thing that popped into my, <laughs> that kind of popped into my mind was also like because we're like developing this archive and I think the way that we feature youth's voices I think was something also really intentional because I remember prior to being a master's student I worked in a lot of drop-in capacities with queer youth and just like seeing those stories specifically outside of Vancouver in Langley um, with queer youth who are doing incredible work and unfortunately for some because of various things you know passed on that like their work wasn't being remembered 
And so like thinking about like, well, often in some of the discussions around like um, queer experience in archives, how oftentimes we, it's, it's, it falls onto us to remember you know, the people that we love, the, peop the people who do the work in our community. And so it's like part of like that that like kind of informs our decision to work with youth is like, well, not only do we want to, you know, provide you with generous honorary, but um, also like feature your work somewhere where like you can go back and be like, see, look, this person has recognized the work that I do. Not that we offer any sort of legitimacy or kind of certificate or whatnot, um, but, you know, to be like, this also is a record of the work that you've done and no one can take that away from you and also we're creating a place here where it's concrete and you can go back and other people can also visit it and be like oh cool there's a really cool tomorrow activist by the name of Kalani Regis who does this really cool work and podcasts and so on and so forth so I think that's the thing too just like remembering you know uh, Carolyn So I thought I'll ask a wrapping up kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> because um, this is great. I've listened to a few of the podcast episodes, not all of them yet. Um, and you did mention kind of under your breath that this is also a recruiting event. But then there was no real mention of how is this going to go on? Is this, is this the end? Yeah, wow. Ooh, what a what a what a great question! What an existential question to end to end the event on. Is this the end? Is this the end? I don't know. Um, you know, I think was it in your conversation with Renisa? You talked about like how to approach the end or something. I don't know. Sorry, it was such a long time ago. I, yeah, um, and figuring out like, do we continue? Do we not? There, there are some of our future collaborators are potentially interested in continuing the podcast, but I'm also someone who, you know. Sometimes it's okay for things to end, even though we would like them to continue, because maybe it's just better. And also opens up space for those similar resources to like help, you know, start other types of podcasts or other sort of like digital ways to tell stories. And so, is the podcast continuing? Yes, in the short term, and in the long term, I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps not. Um, but I think if we if we end it at the I don't know was it four more episodes that were five potentially. Um, that'll take us into May, and I think by that time, I think we'll be very glad to, <laughs> to end things. So, yeah, I hopefully, or hand it off, because I think one thing with all these different sort of episode structures is that, like, we're not married to any format. Uh, we can't really fully describe what the podcast is about. So it's like, there's, it's no loss to kind of leave it to someone else to come after and maybe turn it to something completely different. Did I answer? Thank you. Looking backwards and forwards, as, as, as we do, um, I, I, I brandished the 2018-19 Green College Annual Report in Society magazine at the beginning just as a kind of souvenir of life before the great confinement. Um, <laughs> the double issue, we're calling it a socially condensed double issue for the 2019-2021 COVID-affected period at Green College is now in the press. Some of you, when you finally see this, either in a printed copy or, or in a digital copy, will go, oh, my, oh my, yes, I was there for that. Um, there's a feature piece written by Mary Hill, resident here at the time, called, If You're Not Feeling Uncomfortable, I Haven't Done My Job, Shifting Traditions with Imogen Co. Uh, a chemist and biologist from what was then Ryerson University who came to Green College in the fall of 2019 at the invitation essentially of Daphne Ling who would be sitting there and will be joining us soon we hope uh, Daphne said there's this great person who works especially on equity and inclusion issues in STEM disciplines she comes out to Vancouver and 
Victoria all the time uh, for her other academic work, we should have her to the college. And, and, and so you resident members at the time did. She was, in fact, the first successfully landed Sester and I degree visiting professor nominated, chosen, hosted by resident members of the college. Um, and, and that event is commemorated in this piece that Mary wrote, and there's a lovely photograph here. Well, there are two equally lovely photographs. I'll, I'll pass this round, be careful with it. One of Rodney and Caroline and Andrew Alexander and Daphne Ling and Azar Tayabji. Um, so that's a happy memory. And then there's one of Rodney and Imogen Co. at the fireside. And not to make you know, too many sweeping connections between data points at Green College, there is a certain process, however you know, halting and you know, COVID effective, that leads from that kind of moment to this kind of moment. Um, and who knows where this trajectory will go next. Um, you never graduate from Green College, you just eventually have to leave. <laughs> I say that feelingly as someone whose time is nearly up. We have graduates here who have either left or will in due course leave Green College. They'll leave it in better shape than they found it. But what happens after that or what happens in the, in the meantime is really kind of up for grabs. And you know, one of the responsibilities that we shouldn't ever feel at Green College is that we have to carry on doing whatever other people were doing just before us, however brilliant, breakthrough, and exciting it was. Greenies will keep doing whatever they are moved to do in the strange combinations that they make once they get going. Um, that said, we don't want to waste this moment or any of the potential and energy that the, the patchworks podcast has created. I love Rodney's throwaway remark, oh dear, I, I'm an archetype, no, a stereotype. Maybe you're an archetype and a stereotype. Maybe we have three archetypes here, and I see them on an ocean, because that's apparently where you all ended up. Um, like those figures in Bill Reed's Jade Canoe at the, at the Vancouver um, Airport, International Departures, only this time with a, a wonderful version of that, that quilt to protect them. Um, when they get into the rough weather. Um, so this boat is going somewhere. We, wanna, we want to have something happening in its wake. Other resources for this kind of thinking about action, talking that is a kind of action, in view of all kinds of actions, are not yet quite foreseeable. There will be a workshop here in this room at Green College on Saturday the 1st of October, under the banner headline, Coalitional Possibilities. If you live at Green College at the moment, you got a heads up about this just yesterday. Um, we're not advertising it generally because there are only a few slots for this workshop, um, organized by um, an early career uh, colleague of ours at um, the Arnold School of Law, Brenna Bandar. She's bringing in one Green visiting professor in person from Yale University, Roderick Ferguson, uh, another from London, Gail Lewis, will be attending via Zoom. She's put together a remarkable group of um, people, local uh, talent mainly, uh, to discuss a host of issues having to do with the possibilities of concerted action alliance to get urgent uh, issues addressed. Let me just read you the abstract for the conference, or workshop rather, as a whole, this one-day workshop will explore critical methods, political formations, and psycho-effective orientations that create, quote, coalitional possibilities. Scholars from law, political theory, literature, and geography will explore practices, both historical and contemporary, that present a multitude of possibilities for resistance and refusal of institutional structural and state forms of racialized gendered violence and dispossession and the revitalization of anti-colonial and liberatory spaces. There's a lot in that sentence, but there's a, a day-long workshop to unpack uh, some of those potentials. And it's a remarkable um, rainbow coalition of scholars that Brenner is bringing together. And the space for 10 or 12 greenies or green-associated green individuals to join. Some of you 
have already signed up for this. There are still a few places. Um, if we don't fill them all in the next few days, I'm going to make sure the people at St. John's know about this too, but you've still got a little bit of time um, to spread the word about this. Take, if you like, one of these flyers, particularly if you weren't, if you're not on the GC residence list, sir, you won't have had any other heads up about this yet. Um, coalitional possibilities, Saturday the 1st of October, in this space, with a catered lunch, um, two Cecil and I degree visiting professors uh, at once, and a great deal besides. That there are very good energies uh, circulating and some remarkable resources available right here. Let, let your friends know, uh, let your allies and associates know, and then I guess we'll wait and see, but we'll wait and see with that kind of propensity to assist and to forward useful forms of action as soon as we see them and to congratulate and to thank people who managed to carry off projects of the scope and depth and extent of, of, of this. this. This has really been an extraordinary achievement already. You're not done yet, and there will be an archive. Uh, that's not going to go away. That will be a place for people to go back to um, and refresh their ideas for years to come. So much of what we do here happens in the moment, and then you have to hold on to that feeling and take it somewhere else. Here, at least, there's going to be a repository. Mm. That doesn't sound as dynamic as, of course, it is. As soon as you go there, it turns out to be more like, oh, an ocean, all of those <laughs> uh, good things. <laughs> right, thank you. I think by now they probably have a few drinks and some cheese yeah. and crackers lined up. Let's go over the way, having first thanked our Patchworks podcast team. <laughs>